Welcome to the Tim Booker channel, where wisdom is worth spreading. Wishing you an enjoyable listening experience. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a book by the American historian Mark Levinson. The book is titled, An Extraordinary Time. It's a work that spans over 370 years and consists of 220,000 words. Despite its not so long length, its theme is tremendously important. The book delves into an economic crisis that altered the course of the entire world. This crisis occurred in 1973, about half a century ago from today. However, the questions it raised remain relevant to every nation and individual, as they pertain to the challenge of maintaining rapid economic growth. If you're interested in economic matters, you've probably come across key terms while reading the news, such as GDP growth rate, employment rate, and inflation rate. Naturally, we all hope for continuous GDP growth, stable employment, and moderate inflation rates, both on a personal level and for our countries. Yet, we're aware that economies undergo cycles of ups and downs. The dream of perpetual prosperity is likely unattainable. However, there was an era when not only did GDP and national incomes of all nations experience high-speed growth, but they also remained relatively stable for an unprecedented 25 years. This period is what Levinson refers to as the post-war era of prosperity, which spanned from 1948 to 1973. During this time, global per capita income doubled, and the annual GDP growth rate of major industrialized nations even exceeded 8% at one point. Economists of the time were thrilled and believed that the cyclical nature of the world economy had been conquered. Governments around the world were encouraged to follow the successful policies of these 25 years, intervening in their economies to sustain the prosperity indefinitely. However, this optimistic vision shattered in 1973 with the outbreak of the Fourth Middle East War. Arab countries, previously exporting to Europe and the United States, imposed embargoes. This led to rising prices and a contraction in manufacturing. Governments worldwide responded by implementing the successful intervention policies of the past 25 years, from interest rate adjustments to increased public spending. Yet, instead of restoring prosperity, stagnation and high inflation, known as stagflation, emerged. The initial recession of 1975 eventually ended, but global GDP growth dropped by half from its pre-crisis levels. Efforts to stimulate the economy appeared ineffective. Governments then turned to a wave of reverse actions, reducing intervention and allowing markets to rebalance. This approach, often termed new conservatism economics, addressed short-term recovery but still couldn't overcome the cyclical nature of the economy. History had come full circle, returning to the initial question, why is it so difficult to sustain rapid economic growth? To answer this, Levinson introduces a key concept, productivity. He asserts that improving productivity is the linchpin to maintaining economic growth. Productivity is influenced by multiple factors, such as advancements in labor quality, investment growth, and technological innovation. In the 25 years before 1973, a fortuitous combination of these factors led to a rapid increase in productivity, resulting in prosperity. However, this prosperity was not pre-planned and cannot be replicated exactly. Normal fluctuations in productivity occur in most years, causing economic cycles. Levinson's profound insights into these turning points not only enhance our understanding of today's global economy but also enable us to develop more rational personal financial expectations. Levinson, an expert in studying economic globalization, holds a PhD in history from New York University. He has worked as an analyst at J.P. Morgan and is currently a senior editor at The Economist. His book, The Box, How the Shipping Container Made the World Smaller and the World Economy Bigger, earned praise from Bill Gates, who noted that reading Levinson's work changed his perspective on the world economy. Similarly, An Extraordinary Time, published in 2016, was named the Washington Post's Best Economics Book of the Year, promising a rewarding reading experience. In the following two parts, I will introduce the book's main content. Firstly, we'll explore the factors that contributed to continuous global economic growth in the 25 years before 1973, and why these factors failed to prevent the 1973 crisis. Secondly, I'll summarize the efforts governments made to combat the economic crisis and why they couldn't replicate the pre-crisis prosperity. Lastly, I'll provide an overview of how Levinson's book can enhance our comprehension of the world economy. Let's start by returning to the world of 1948, which marks the beginning of the post-war era of prosperity. In that year, the Second World War had ended, 
but the economic devastation it left behind was far from being overcome. Germany, once Europe's leading industrial power, was reduced to ruins, with industrial output shrinking by two-thirds. France's GDP decreased by half, and the UK, a major trading nation, suffered a direct loss of 60% of its exports. As for the United States, although it appeared to benefit from wartime economics, government policies controlling prices and wages during the war limited income growth for both private business owners and ordinary laborers. In the US, for instance, there was a surplus of aircraft and artillery, yet shortages of underwear and socks were widespread. In 1946 alone, 4.6 million workers took to the streets in demonstrations demanding wage increases. However, within this atmosphere of despair, there were factors favoring economic revival that weren't immediately apparent. Notably, there were significant achievements in technological innovation. Electronic computers, nuclear reactors, and antibiotics were developed during World War II, building upon scientific principles known before the war but accelerated for wartime needs. After the war, these technologies were transferred to civilian use, stimulating industrial production, electricity, and pharmaceuticals, which significantly boosted the concept of productivity Levinson emphasizes. Moreover, as soon as the war ended, young men returned to civilian life, becoming a fresh labor force across various industries. Scholarships for veterans were introduced in the U.S. and many European countries, coupled with increased enrollment in public universities. This led to an enhanced labor force with improved skills, further contributing to productivity. Raising productivity requires substantial investment, and on this front, most governments were proactive. In Europe, the war had severely damaged factories, roads, and housing, necessitating extensive reconstruction and thus creating strong demand for public investment. Additionally, private businesses that adopted conservative strategies during the war were now motivated to purchase new machinery and expand production with the return of peace. In the realm of capitalism, the United States played a central role. In 1948, the U.S. initiated the Marshall Plan for Europe and Economic Reform Plans for Japan, channeling wartime accumulated capital to other global regions and accelerating economic recovery. The other half of the bipolar world, the Soviet Union, also introduced economic aid programs for its allies. This marked the beginning of the post-war era of prosperity. However, it's important to note that among the factors mentioned, government intervention played a pivotal role. This might create an impression that economic growth is controllable and can be meticulously planned by governments. However, Levinson points out that post-war economic prosperity also depended on fortuitous factors. Chance and coincidence were closely intertwined. The first of these accidental factors was the destruction caused by the war. If not for the extensive destruction of infrastructure in Europe by World War II, countries and businesses would not have been driven to invest so vigorously. Furthermore, after the war, a worldwide population boom occurred, marked by the famous, baby boomer, generation. This generation not only provided essential labor for economic growth but also created robust consumer demand, driving the sale of manufactured goods. However, the prosperity arrived abruptly and rapidly. During this period of high-speed growth from 1948 to 1973, everyone's minds were heated. Throughout Western Europe, productivity increased by 300%, and GDP tripled. Japan's productivity and per capita income both increased sixfold. During these years, many newly independent third world countries achieved rapid GDP growth through urbanization and exporting raw materials. For instance, Mexico and Brazil demonstrated their strongest economic performance of the 20th century during this post-war era of prosperity. Inspired by this optimistic phenomenon, a new economic school emerged starting from the 1950s in the United States, West Germany, and Argentina. This school advocated for state intervention in the economy. They believed that the post-war prosperity was a direct result of government actions, such as increasing public spending to stimulate employment. These experiences, they argued, could be replicated indefinitely to sustain high-speed growth. When you hear the term, state intervention, you might immediately think of the British economist John Maynard Keynes. Keynes believed that governments could counteract the effects of economic cycles by actively adjusting fiscal and monetary policies to improve employment and income conditions for the public. However, the new economic school was even more radical than Keynes. They likened the national economy to an engine, and the government as the operator of this machine. When the machine operated smoothly, key variables like employment rate, 
GDP growth rate, and inflation rate would be displayed on the screen. Each variable had an optimal solution. The government only needed to monitor these variables and adjust any deviations from their optimal solutions to keep the machine running smoothly. Harold Heller, the chief economic advisor to U.S. President Kennedy, once stated that with the help of electronic computers and mathematical models, they could predict the optimal state of the U.S. economy. Carl Schiller, the economic minister of West Germany, even calculated precise figures for each optimal variable. He stated that annual GDP growth should not be lower than 4%, unemployment should be under 0.8%, and inflation should remain below 1%. Schiller proudly remarked that managing the economy was as easy as solving a Rubik's Cube, a few twists and turns, and it's done. However, can managing an economy really be that straightforward? Even just listening to this might raise suspicions. Yet, during the prosperous 25 years after the war, this new economic theory was indeed quite effective. In 1967, for example, when West Germany faced a brief economic recession, Schiller examined his Rubik's Cube and decided to increase public spending and reduce taxes. As a result, the recession ended in less than six months. A similar situation occurred in the United States. Throughout the 1960s, while grappling with the Vietnam War, the U.S. still managed to achieve an average GDP growth rate of 4.2% and unemployment remained below 6%. Notably, income inequality in the U.S. significantly improved during this period. The wealthiest 0.1% of the population saw a decline in their share of the social wealth. By the end of 1972, the World Bank published data indicating a global per capita income growth rate of 4.5%. This essentially meant that every 16 years, everyone's income could double. However, why did this prolonged period of prosperity suddenly come to an end due to an unexpected economic crisis? Author Levinson offers his observations on this matter. Firstly, while the new economic school believed that regulating the economy only required pressing a few buttons, the actual reactions of the public were far from uniform. For instance, we've heard of the concept of the welfare state, which emerged in 1950s Europe. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Statistics, by the 1960s, the costs of the welfare state had exceeded GDP growth rates, becoming a considerable burden. This left governments with two options, raise taxes or borrow. Ordinary people generally wanted higher welfare benefits and lower taxes. If the government increased taxes, voters would voice their dissatisfaction through elections, leading to political turnover. Most governments were quickly voted out of power, leaving them with only the option of long-term fiscal deficits. When a real crisis hit, governments would press the deficit button hoping to stimulate recovery. However, the additional spending would often be insufficient, mainly covering interest on old debts, thus failing to achieve the intended regulatory effect. Western European countries hesitated to raise taxes due to public resistance, and deficits alone weren't enough to counter crises. The situation in the United States was quite similar, and there was also a unique complication, its exchange rate system. Towards the end of World War II in 1944, the capitalist world established the famous Bretton Woods system. Under this system, the exchange rates of various currencies were pegged to the US dollar, which was in turn linked to gold. These currencies' values essentially became tied to the US dollar, which was now effectively tied to gold. However, in 1971, President Nixon had to make the tough decision to temporarily suspend the convertibility of the U.S. dollar into gold. By February 1973, the Bretton Woods system had completely collapsed, marking the end of fixed exchange rates and ushering in the era of floating exchange rates. To be fair, the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, although a significant event, didn't have an immediate and pronounced impact on developed countries. The U.S. government opted to stimulate the market by lowering interest rates, resulting in a rebound in interest rates and consumer demand. Nixon's economic advisors optimistically predicted that the U.S. GDP growth rate could reach 7% in 1973. Western European countries and Japan were also experiencing a buoyant economic environment due to relaxed inflation requirements. House prices in London and Tokyo were still on the rise. Seemingly, no one realized the cost of exchange rate fluctuations, which was actually being borne by the distant Middle East. Led by Saudi Arabia, the oil-producing countries of the Middle East had previously obtained U.S. dollars through oil exports and used those dollars to purchase necessary goods from Europe. After the U.S. dollar was decoupled from gold, its value effectively declined. 
As a result, the oil-producing country's income was reduced. OPEC, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, immediately responded. In the fall of 1973, OPEC convened representatives from eight countries, including the US, the UK, and Japan, and demanded a 100% increase in oil prices. However, the Nixon administration firmly rejected this demand. This was the last warning before the economic crisis erupted. In this same year, 1973, the relationship between the oil-producing countries of the Middle East and the Western world was undergoing change. In October 1973, the Fourth Arab-Israeli War broke out. The United States openly declared support for Israel, which put it at odds with the Arab world. In response, OPEC member countries, primarily Arab nations, immediately decided to impose an oil embargo on the United States, Japan, and Western Europe, which lasted for three months. During those three months, the U.S. GDP shrank by 6%, gas stations displayed signs of being sold out, and numerous factories were forced to halt production. In December 1973, the eight countries, including the U.S., the U.K., and Japan, had to compromise and sign price adjustment agreements with the oil-producing countries, resulting in a one-time global oil price surge of 300%. This hasty series of events marked the end of the 25-year post-war era of prosperity, which had been sustained by the metaphorical lifeblood of cheap Middle Eastern oil. For instance, Japan, a resource-poor island nation, had become a global leader in steel, chemical, and aluminum exports in the 1960s due to low oil prices. However, by 1973, the relationship between the oil-producing countries of the Middle East and the Western world was shifting dramatically. All right, the above is what the book, Great Turning Point, records about the causes of the 25-year period of economic prosperity and its end in 1973. Starting from the oil embargo of 1973, developed countries in Europe and America experienced a year and a half of economic recession. Inflation rates kept rising, and unemployment reached new post-World War II highs. Consumer spending also remained sluggish. The United States, West Germany, and Japan all witnessed the phenomenon of small and medium-sized bank failures. The British government even had to borrow from the International Monetary Fund to sustain its operations. During this period, Japanese housewives rushed into stores to hoard toilet paper and daily necessities because they believed that the national finances could go bankrupt at any time. According to the perspective of the new economic school, crises were not to be feared, as governments had various tools for regulation. By manipulating the buttons on the economic machine, like solving a Rubik's Cube, everything would return to normal. At the time, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, which is the U.S. Central Bank, Arthur Burns, took this approach. The U.S. regulation method involved lowering interest rates to stimulate funds flowing into the production sector for a quick rebound. However, President Nixon had a different view, he prioritized controlling inflation and was willing to sacrifice a slower recovery rate. As a result, U.S. policy turned into a behind-the-scenes battle between the president and the central bank chairman. Interest rates fluctuated back and forth over a year and more, but inflation remained high and failed to rebound, leading to stagflation. Western European countries stuck to their old playbook, increasing public expenditure and accepting the risk of deficits to meet citizens' welfare demands. For example, in Sweden, state-owned enterprises and government departments doubled their workforce and signed generous agreements with labor unions. However, this exacerbated the economic burden. As a result of rising oil prices, industries like shipbuilding and shipping lost competitiveness and failed to recover. The economic growth formula that worked in the past seemed to fail completely in the face of the crisis of 1973. Levinson, the author, believed that the key factor was the developed country's productivity, which had entered a stagnant phase. The most crucial factor affecting productivity is technological innovation, and the research outcomes around the World War II era had been absorbed over two to three decades, causing developed countries' industrial products to lose their technical advantage. Their export growth began to slow down. Additionally, the second factor influencing productivity was the workforce. Due to widespread welfare policies and high wages, blue-collar workers in developed countries had significantly higher labor costs than other regions, and the skill differences were not necessarily significant. This caused investors to move factories out of the U.S. and Western Europe to areas with lower wage standards. The rise of the Asian tigers, as we know them, emerged against this backdrop. Developed countries lost jobs, 
but welfare expenditures remain substantial, dragging down economic growth. In recent years, we frequently hear about trade wars in the news, as if it's something new. However, after the economic crisis of 1973, a trade war erupted in a capitalist world involving the United States and Japan. In the 1960s, Japan's exports mainly consisted of imitation products, chemicals, and small appliances. These industries were heavily affected during the 1973 economic crisis. To reverse the downturn, the Japanese government decided to upgrade industries and shifted focus to automobile manufacturing and electronics. Coincidentally, with the sharp increase in global oil prices, fuel-efficient Japanese cars gained an opportunity to enter North American and Western European markets. From 1973 to 1980, Japan's annual car exports tripled, and one in every four cars sold in the U.S. market was from Japan. However, the U.S. automobile industry was defeated by its competitors. In 1980 alone, car production declined by 25%, resulting in 300,000 job layoffs. To protect local jobs, the U.S. government proactively initiated a trade war against Japan, imposing a 15% tariff on screws and nuts from Japan in 1979. In 1981, the Reagan administration compelled Japan to accept automobile export quotas. Within three years, the total number of cars exported to the U.S. could not exceed 1.68 million units. According to estimates by the U.S. International Trade Commission, this decision saved 44,000 jobs in U.S. manufacturing. However, fewer Japanese cars didn't necessarily mean consumers would switch to buying American cars. People preferred fuel-efficient Japanese cars even if the prices were higher. Consequently, to protect 44,000 jobs, U.S. car buyers ended up paying an extra $8.5 billion. On average, this cost amounted to $193,000 per job saved, which is six times the average salary. Such a high-cost trade war couldn't be sustained indefinitely. Inflation remained persistently high, growth was unstable, and the trade war had limited impact. By the mid-1980s, the Reagan administration had exhausted most of its regulatory tools, yet the U.S. economy hadn't achieved a high growth rate. At this point, the president decided to change strategy. In 